April 5th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Joshua chapters 3 through 5 of the Old Testament. Bright and early the next morning, Joshua and the Israelites left Shittim and came to the Jordan. They camped there before crossing the river. After three days, the leaders went through the camp and commanded the people, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priest, you must leave here and walk behind it. But stay about 3,000 feet behind it. Keep your distance so you can see which way you should go, for you have not traveled this way before. Joshua told the people, Ritually consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will perform miraculous deeds among you. Joshua told the priest, Pick up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they picked up the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of the people. The Lord told Joshua, This very day I will begin to honor you before all Israel, so they will know that I am with you, just as I was with Moses. Instruct the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the bank of the Jordan River, wade into the water. Joshua told the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. Joshua continued, This is how you will know the living God is among you and that he will truly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. Look, the Ark of the Covenant of the ruler of the whole earth is ready to enter the Jordan ahead of you. Now select for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one per tribe. When the feet of the priests carrying the Ark of the Lord, the ruler of the whole earth, touch the water of the Jordan, the water coming downstream toward you will stop flowing and pile up. So when the people left their tents to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. When the ones carrying the Ark reached the Jordan and the feet of the priests carrying the Ark touched the surface of the water, the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest time, the water coming downstream toward them stopped flowing. It piled up far upstream at Adam, the city near Zarethan. There was no water at all flowing to the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea. The people crossed the river opposite Jericho. The priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan. All Israel crossed over on dry ground until the entire nation was on the other side. When the entire nation was on the other side, the Lord told Joshua, Select for yourselves twelve men from the people, one per tribe. Instruct them, pick up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from the very place where the priests stand firmly, and carry them over with you, and put them in the place where you camp tonight. Joshua summoned the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one per tribe. Joshua told them, Go in front of the ark of the Lord your God, to the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to put a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the Israelite tribes. The stones will be a reminder to you. When your children ask someday, why are these stones important to you? Tell them how the water of the Jordan stopped flowing before the of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the water of the Jordan stopped flowing. These stones will be a lasting memorial for the Israelites. The Israelites did just as Joshua commanded. They picked up twelve stones, according to the number of the Israelite tribes, from the middle of the Jordan as the Lord had instructed Joshua. They carried them over with them to the camp and put them there. Joshua also set up twelve stones in the middle of the Jordan, in the very place where the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant stood. They remain there to this very day. Now the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant were standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua to tell the people was accomplished, in accordance with all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people went across quickly, and when all the people had finished crossing the Ark of the Lord and the priests crossed as the people looked on, the Reubenites, Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over armed for battle ahead of the Israelites just as Moses had instructed them. About 40,000 battle-ready troops marched past the Lord to fight on the plains of Jericho. That day the Lord brought honor to Joshua before all Israel. They respected him all his life, just as they had respected Moses. The Lord told Joshua, 
Instruct the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenantal Laws to come up from the Jordan. So Joshua instructed the priests, Come up from the Jordan. The priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the middle of the Jordan. And as soon as they set foot on dry land, the water of the Jordan flowed again and returned to flood stage. The people went up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and camped in Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. Now Joshua set up in Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken from the Jordan. He told the Israelites, When your children someday ask their fathers, What do these stones represent? Explain to your children. Israel crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the water of the Jordan before you while you crossed over. It was just like when the Lord your God dried up the Red Sea before us while we crossed it. He has done this so that all the nations of the earth might recognize the Lord's power and so you might always obey the Lord your God. When all the Amorite kings on the west side of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the sea coast heard how the Lord had dried up the water of the Jordan before the Israelites while they crossed, they lost their courage and could not even breathe for fear of the Israelites. At that time, the Lord told Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites once again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites on the hill of the foreskins. This is why Joshua had to circumcise them. All the men old enough to fight when they left Egypt died on the journey through the desert after they left Egypt. Now all the men who left were circumcised, but all the sons born on the journey through the desert after they left Egypt were uncircumcised. Indeed, for forty years the Israelites traveled through the desert until all the men old enough to fight when they left Egypt, the ones who had disobeyed the Lord, died off. For the Lord had sworn a solemn oath to them that he would not let them see the land he had sworn on oath to give them, a land rich in milk and honey. He replaced them with their sons, whom Joshua circumcised. They were uncircumcised. Their fathers had not circumcised them along the way. When all the men had been circumcised, they stayed there in the camp until they had healed. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have taken away the disgrace of Egypt from you. So that place is called Gilgal, even to this day. So the Israelites camped in Gilgal and celebrated the Passover in the evening of the fourteenth day of the month on the plains of Jericho. They ate some of the produce of the land the day after the Passover, including unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped appearing the day they ate some of the produce of the land. The Israelites never ate manna again. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him holding a drawn sword. Joshua approached him and asked him, Are you on our side or allied with our enemies? He answered, Truly I am the commander of the Lord's army. Now I have arrived. Joshua bowed down with his face to the ground and asked, What does my master want to say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army answered Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, because the place where you stand is holy. Joshua did so. God, today in our reading, you have fulfilled your promise that you made all the way back in Genesis 12. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And this is the first chapter in the Bible that we hear Israel called a nation. Uh, that they are coming over into your promised land, the land that you promised them. But I think my favorite part in here is when it says when all the Amorite kings on the west side and the Canaanite kings along the sea coast heard what you did, they lost their courage and could not even breathe for fear of the Israelites. I think of all of the things that you do without us even realizing the connection. All of the things that you keep us from, all of the things that you give us, all of the orchestrating of this amazing world that you've given us to live in down here. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and and he was fussing about something, uh, something happening. And as I talked him through your grace and your mercy and your power over everything 
it was so funny because suddenly he's like, oh, wait, you mean God actually probably kept me from something bad happening? And here I am fussing because I couldn't get what I wanted. And I think of that when I'm reading this particular chapter that you were going before them, even though they stood in awe of the miracle of you once again parting the seas for them to safely cross on dry ground. And they probably thought that was all about them. What they may not have realized until even later on, or maybe never, is part of the reason you were doing this was to show your power to the up and coming areas that they were about to have to take over, Joshua and the nation of Israel. And so how amazing that your act that allowed your nation to cross safely over into their promised land awed them and entrusted them in you once again and also in their leader, Joshua. But you were already working on what was coming ahead of them. And I think you do that so much in our lives, God, that even though we try and make it all about us, that you do something in our life like parting the seas and making things safe. We're like, oh, that was so about me. But what we don't get is there's so many other things at play here. Things that you may be keeping us from, things that you may be intentionally giving us, things that you may be allowing to have happen to us that have nothing to do with us, that they actually have to do with other people watching that situation happen. Or sometimes more importantly, how we react to the situation. You know, being online gives gives people such a great opportunity to see into people's lives for good or for bad. And I watch people who, you know, claim to be Christian, go to church, and then they say these horrid things online. And I watch how people are watching what they're doing, and they think it's all about them, that they're just voicing their opinion on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. But what they don't understand is... Just like when you parted the seas, you were doing that not only so that they could safely get across, but for other reasons. People are really watching people's words, not only for what they post so they get an idea who the person is, but they're making judgments based upon if you say you're Christian, yet you're posting this, does that make all Christians hypocrites? What does that look like? And so I think we need to keep that in mind that not only are you constantly working on multiple things all at once, so many things that we can't even understand. And, and a lot of times it's not all about us. It may feel like that tornado swirling around us, but you're really doing this for other people, for other things to have happen. And then too, we've got to really watch it ourselves. That if we think we're making statements, whether in email or to our best friend or, or online, that is something that we're making a statement about, we've got to realize that a lot of people see that information or will eventually hear that information. Anything that we say, we do, we write, we put out there should be fine for anyone to hear about uh, because we do have that effect on people. God, in all things, I just want you to be glorified. In all things, I just want people to get that you are in control. That even when we see or think that something bad is happening to us or other people, that you are still in full control of that. It's not like you've turned your back and you don't know what's going on. You're in full control of everything. Thank you, God. Thank you so much for that. In your son's name we pray. Amen.